These are my disclosures that have nothing to do with anything that I am talking about today. So I went almost on a whim to, to Boston. I will say that as a medical student at UCSF, I was profoundly moved by one of my professors, TK Hunt, Tom Hunt, who was an expert in wound healing. He, and he would tell us all these stories. I don't know if Dr. Mitchell or any of the doctors are familiar with Tom Hunt, but he was at UCSF for many years. And he was a Harvard medical student and a Harvard undergrad. Um, and he would tell me stories about his, his being, being a medical student at Harvard, doing rotations at Boston City Hospital and matching as an intern at Boston City Hospital. And, at that, and so I actually had this idea I didn't understand geography. And so I thought Boston was, like Boston City Hospital was the best hospital in Boston. It's the one I, Dr. Hunt told me about and stories of going from there to being drafted in the army. And, 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 and it was all tied together in my mind. He followed, and then he followed Jan Gilbert Dumphy to UCSF. And, and I, I think there are all these stories that were inculcated in my, my Bay Area mind. And when I, the idea came to me that I might actually consider leaving the Bay Area for the first time in my life, I, of course, thought of Boston, and I thought, honestly, of Boston City Hospital. And I signed up for a rotation at Harvard, and I ended up, to my surprise, not at Boston City Hospital, because the Harvard students had all been kicked out, but at, at Mass General Hospital. So I ended up mass, matching there for residency, kind of much to my surprise. And, and I, I actually had a wonderful residency training program, but I operated on a very undiverse set of patients at this particular time. In fact, the residents, the nurses, and the doctors were extremely undiverse. So I would actually walk down Charles Street, which is the main street there, and I would see another Asian female resident in Carolyn Sen, who's a medicine resident, and that would be the only person of color that I would see for the entire day it, it, on the street, in the hospital, etc. And so it was a very interesting experience. It was very different than coming from San Francisco, where I had been a medical student, um, and it was just a, it was a little bit of a dislocated experience, but great surgical training. But then when I did fellowship, I went to Houston and MD Anderson, and for the first time, I was operating on a diverse patient population. And I'm a failed basic scientist. I loved basic science. I did three years in the lab. I did two, a year and more in the lab in, in, in medical school and then three years in the lab doing a postdoc at, 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 in molecular medicine with, with Richard Mulligan. And I, I, I sort of realized with the cases that I wanted to do, I wasn't gonna be able to operate at the best level that I wanted and run a basic science lab and get funded. I, I came to, it was a very painful realization because I knew if I wanted to be basic science, I wanted to be Judith Fulton. I didn't want or Richard Mulligan. I didn't want to be Jennifer Sang, who does pancreas surgery and then dabbles in a little vanity lab at the time. I don't want to insult anybody here who is able to maintain a really busy clinical practice with really bad cases that, that go south and manage to get NIH funding. But I knew I, I was not of that caliber of person. And, and so when I was at MD Anderson, I started to observe the patient population, the diverse patient population of Houston, of Harris County, plus the patient population that flies from everywhere else in the world to get their care at MD Anderson and compare the experiences of these particular patients. So I was on the breast service, my first month uh, rotation, and I needed to get an abstract into the Society of Surgical Oncology because at the time, that was the thing. You got an abstract in, you met some people, you auditioned for jobs, and by the second year, you're already locking up a job to, to, to start. So I, I made this observation when I was a fellow on this service to Henry Cure, who was then attending, I said, Dr. Cure, how come we have so many young black women that are getting mastectomies and they're not getting reconstructed right, right away? There seems to be a difference. And this is a surgical observation. You see three, it's suddenly a series. And, 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 and he said, that's just not true. Like we're at MD Anderson. We are not paid. We're not, the, the, the reimbursement has nothing to do with the case mix, has nothing to do with, the, um, with, with anything. And, and so we have no incentive to treat people differently. And we're obviously not racist. So of course that's not true. And so to his credit, I said, well, let me look at it then. If it's absolutely not true, let me at least ask the question. And to their everlasting credit, I could have never asked this kind of conversation, even had this kind of hypothesis in residency, but they said, okay. Yeah. And so between Dr. Cure and then Steve Kronowitz, who was a plastic surgeon there, we, we, I looked at the database that Dr. Kelly Hunt had started there. I looked at more than a thousand patients that underwent mastectomy for cancer in a relatively short period of time. And these are real paper charts. So I literally looked through a thousand really heavy paper charts that would teeter over and annoy my co-fellows like Tim Pollock and Tom Aloya. And, but, but I looked through all these charts and then I looked at them again. And what we actually found was that in, in fact, African-American patients were less likely to be immediately reconstructed after mastectomy for breast cancer. Um, and so then you can see that white, Hispanics and Asian are all about the same. Middle Eastern is a different group because this group of people in general were flying from the UAE or 
from, from Kuwait or wherever, having their cancer surgery done at MD Anderson, they fly back home and, and have delayed reconstruction if they're gonna have reconstruction. So that's a very different group of people. But the question is, and this is early disparities work, is it's not just that there's a, a disparity, but the real question is why? Like, why? Because it's not, you can fill in the blank and that's why people get excited. They get, oh, you know, that it's a pair mix. Oh, it's that people have biases. Oh, that's not, that's not always the case. Um, it, you don't know. If, you, if your mind just fills in the blank, it's easy to get agitated and, and, and make jump to assumptions and then it actually doesn't help anything at all. So we went back all the way through all these other charts to try to ascertain the steps by which by, by which this disparity occurred. So we looked through the charts and we found, I, I just used what was written in the, in the dictated notes. So whether or not the surgical oncologist, the breast surgical oncologist referred, referred in the, his or her note um, to, to reconstruction, whether they referred to it or not. And, and then the next step was whether or not the patient accepted the referral. There are differences in patients. So sometimes the patients may not want a referral even if it's accepted. There is some data that shows that black women have better self-esteem after mastectomy or after disfiguring surgery, or, or, or conversely, that white women have worse self-esteem. But there's also a lot that's going on with the patients that we don't know about. Maybe you have too much going on in your life to be able to even stomach additional surgeries and reconstruction. Maybe that doesn't fit with what you need to do with your family, with your job, everything else that you have going on. So there, there are patient factors that may play into this too, not just doctor factors. And then if the patient saw a plastic surgeon, whether or not reconstruction was offered, and then in the end, whether or not they had breast reconstruction after, after mastectomy for cancer. And as you can see here, all the, all the dots point in the same direction. All the hazard ratios are the same. Although you start to lose significance as the numbers get smaller, the hazard ratio is exactly the same. And the overall rate of immediate reconstruction is significantly less for black patients than other patients. So that was my first uh, foray into outcomes research. And then I, I decided that I needed to get a job at Boston Medical Center and BU. And they actually had a job posting for surgical oncologist, which was made for me, I, I was sure. I applied for the job. I, I came out, I interviewed in my very office that I have now. I came several times. I, I, my, my mentor, Doug Evans, was, the, uh, was a BU alum. Or, and he came out to give the big name visiting Mosden professor that year, 2004. They told him I was their top choice. They told him they were working on an offer letter for me. And then it was cricket. I never heard from them again. They, they just ghosted me before there was ghosting. And I, I didn't have a job offer for them. In the end, they, they went a different direction. They decided they didn't need an HPV surgeon. They hired a melanoma specialist, but they didn't tell me this at all. And, and but luckily, luckily in, in May of my second year, second and last year, I was, I was able to get a job offer at the University of Massachusetts Worcester. Now, Mary has alluded to this, that I have kind of an immovable object of a spouse. And, um, and it was, I did look, I don't know if Dr. Longyear is here. I did, I did actually, was still interested in the basic science career. And I did look in New York City, in Manhattan, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, because my husband has always said he wanted to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering. I, oh, not that, but he always said he wanted to go back to New York, excuse me, because his parents lived three, three blocks from Memorial Sloan Kettering. So I interviewed with Yumin Fong and he was offering me immunotherapy lab and it was, it was great. But my husband decided that he didn't, of course didn't want to move back to New York, make double the money and be associate professor instead of instructor because he was too tied to, the, to, the, to his, his existence in, in Massachusetts. So I, I did accept the job at the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Worcester with exactly zero package. Now, Mary and I advise people about packages and what to ask for for your first job. I will say that I, I had zero ability to negotiate. I had zero package, not because they didn't like them, but because I didn't have the resources. I did negotiate for 10,000 10, extra dollars as, as a signing bonus. And I used $5,000 of that to put a down payment on a used Subaru to drive back and forth. And, and $5,000 of that to pay for extra, um, an extra meeting because I only had $2,500 for academic. Am I feeding back? Or oh, somebody's somebody's kid? That's good. I like that. Twenty five hundred dollar. I'm sorry. I only had I only had twenty five hundred dollars, or maybe it was fifteen hundred dollars for meetings, and I wanted to use that additional five thousand dollars so I would at least go to two meetings a year and not completely fall off the academic map. I just say that because yeah, there, there's a lot of what what is the perfect job and there is no perfect job. But the Worcester population was actually very diverse. So this is the population of Worcester now, and it hasn't really changed. But it's about sixty nine percent. Uh, white and 13% black, Latin could be in either group, Asian and, and some other. 
And I started because I didn't have basic science resources. I started uh, an outcomes research lab. And essentially it became a, a resident fellow was looking for me, uh, looking, looking for mentorship. We learned together. That's Jamie McPhee over here, who is now a vascular surgeon, my faculty at the VA in Boston, and a number of other people, including a, a student from WPI, a medical student, another research resident in biostatistics. And we started an outcomes research lab. I also did simultaneously start a basic science effort in collaboration with some top talent at UMass, but I will not allude to that today. So in SOAR in the early years, is a surgical outcomes analysis and research, um, which is an acronym actually my husband came up for because he's very good at naming clinical trials. But um, with, with a succession of research residents, mostly from UMass, we were able to really look at risk. So my early research was all on risk prediction and being able to say, given these particular characteristics, what is the risk of Whipple? What is the risk of complication after cholecystectomy? What's the risk of a liver resection? And this predates the NISQIP calculators. Actually, Dr. Henry Pitt and the individuals at, NS, at NISQIP looked at all of our early work, largely done by research residents with great interest. But overall, we were attempting to try to stratify patients and to determine, that, as we know, that, that patients with certain characteristics are predisposed to do worse, and maybe the tools should differ uh, based, on, based on the patient characteristics and other uh, societal characteristics. And over the last couple decades of work, our, our, our work has focused less around just the observation of disparities to the realization that health equity is essential, that health equity is a right. And how, does, how do we define health equity? The World Health Organization defines it as the absence of avoidable, unfair, or remediable differences in health, health outcomes. This is multifactorial. There's economics, there's race and ethnicity, there's language, there's behavioral health issues, as we increasingly know. So I'm going to take you through a bit of a journey in the next 20 minutes on health inequity as explored by a, by a bunch of surgical residents. Now, the, the work here, what is done, is being done by residents in SOAR and, and outside of SOAR at Boston Medical Center. And it's really their work, and so I'm privileged to be able to, to share with you uh, some of what they've done. So this is Melissa Murphy. She is, she is the, now the chief of surgery at Kent Hospital, which is a Brigham affiliated hospital in Rhode Island, but she was a research resident at UMass then. And she looked at SEER, which is a database that you ha all have access to from the NCI. And she found that black patients present at equal stages with pancreatic cancer, but have fewer resections and lower survival. Because we thought naively, we thought we knew that black patients were enriched for pancreatic cancer. We had a sense that the outcomes were worse, but if you had asked us, our hypothesis would have been that black patients presented with lower access to care, so presented at later stages and with more advanced disease. But Melissa's work was the first work to be done that actually demonstrated that that was actually not true as far as we could tell in SEER, that black patients with pancreatic cancer presented at equal stages with non-black patients, but they had fewer resections, fewer whipples, fewer distal pancreatectomies, and lower survival. But after resection, survival was equivalent. So that suggested to us it was the receipt of care, in this particular case, surgical care, that made the difference. We delved a little deeper. It took years to unpack your Medicare. If you don't do outcomes research work, you can just think, oh, you just unpack this database, and it's very easy. It's like Excel, and you just look at it, and you can say, oh, and you, maybe you hit a button, and you run a Kaplan-Meier curve, and then you have your answer. And I'm being facetious, but some of these databases are inc incredibly difficult. And SEER Medicare is actually not even a database. It's a set of, you know, depending on what, what, what you get, 20 different databases that can be linked by complex linkages and cleaning. But regardless, after years, we, we, we worked on SEER Medicare. And in SEER Medicare, you have the bills. So you can not only see the cancer outcomes. I think of SEER as, like, to some extent, a cancer-based uh, database. But in Medicare, you can actually see whether or not they got a bill. So that means whether or not they got a bill for a certain kind of a doctor, a certain kind of care. You can see that they had, for instance, a CA-99, so potentially in CA Medicare, but you can't actually see the results. So it's, it's complex, it's billing data. But in any case, Dr. Murphy was able to find in CA Medicare that black patients were less likely to have a subspecialty visit, meaning a surgeon, a medical oncologist, or radiation oncologist. After a subspecialty visit, they were less likely to have chemotherapy and or surgical resection. But after you adjust for resection and adjuvant therapy, the survival of black patients is equal to other patients in SEER Medicare. Again, suggesting it's the receipt of care that's the, that's the major step that's important. So I was sitting in Central Mass trying to build a practice 
and competing with the people, my the former mentors and people at large Boston teaching hospitals. And I, I spent some time thinking about, about who travels and who doesn't travel for surgery. And so there was some vested interest in this in terms of building a pancreas program at UMass, but also, again, delving more into the possible inequities in care. And so this is Lindsay Bluss and the late Ted McDay, but together, a series of, of projects, we looked at the volume effect and we expect that the volume effect may, may not be as simple as the more you do, the better your outcomes are. We also hypothesized that regionalization had unequal effects. So we had a collaboration with the Mass Department of Public Health, whereby you can see all the results of all the hospitals um, un unblinded um, to be able to determine what the results are. Whether or not you can publish these data or use them in any way uh, depends on, on some complex, not more than IRBs, but I, I, I won't get into that. But looking at the Mass Massachusetts inpatient discharge database from the DPH, we looked at a cohort of pancreatic resections from 2005. 2005 was the first year I was in practice, 2009, uh, that are, they're adults. And the second source we use, which is unlinked, is, is in the nationwide inpatient sample, the HCUP databases, which you all have access to. So in brief, some of their findings included that, that most patients travel for, for, for pancreatic cancer surgery. People that are less likely to travel or travel less include patients that are minoritized patients. And pe people that are less likely to travel are more likely to have their care at a low volume hospital. So we concluded from this series of work, Ted McDade and Lindsay Bliss and others and I, that in Massachusetts, most pancreatic cancer patients travel more than 10 miles to have surgery. The ones that are more likely to travel are the younger patients, white patients, male patients, and those that reside in higher income zip codes. In the USA, high volume hospital patients have fewer comorbidities, fewer minorities, and worse insurance. So non-white race, non-private insurance or lack of insurance, and comorbidity predict decreased travel or care at a lower volume hospital. So if we posit, which we believe, that there is some volume effect, that the more you do, the fewer complications you, you'll have and the more likely your patients are to survive, those patients that need it the most are being bypassed. So the better patients, the ones that are more selected, are the ones that go to high volume hospitals and thus contribute to some of the high volume effects. At, at BMC, we have gone further to try to look at this volume outcome effect at, and to see if there are things that can ameliorate just the simple equation. Well, basically everybody in the, in, in the country should go to one center to, to have all of their care. Those are overly simplistic models because they say, who, who pays? How does the family get support? If you talk to the people at Johns Hopkins, just to pick on, a, pick on someone who say it is, you know, it's a sin that anybody in the state of Maryland or the whole area goes and has their surgery anywhere else except Johns Hopkins. How does that work? Who pays for the patients to travel to Johns Hopkins? Who takes care of the patients? How do you get the trust in, in, in the hospital that the community should have? So this is Susanna DeHus, who's an intern now at Beth Israel Deaconess and, and Hevia Sachs, my chief of surgical oncology. But they have done a series of papers. These are two of them, but looking at the volume of pancreas adjacent operations as opposed to just pancreas operations. So the question is, if you do gastrectomies and, and livers uh, and biliary reconstructions, does that affect your outcomes for pancreas operations? And the answer, and, and on the second one is for liver. The answer is yes. So it's, it's, it's not just that if you have, to, you have to operate on the right pancreas all the time, you have to be familiar and you have to be, as a surgeon, you have to be familiar with the area and these cases are linked. And then I will say as a hospital, you have to be familiar with taking care of the complications and managing the critical care of these patients. So it's a more complex met metric than the just number of particular widgets that you make at your particular hospital. So to summarize this, the, the pancreas paper, pa hospitals that were low volume in pancreatic pancreatic the but high volume in complex operations demonstrate similar sur surgical outcomes to high volume Whipple centers. So this suggests a model of care that might improve the quality of care for patients that cannot receive care at high volume hospitals. This is Gonera Kasumova, who is a, the senior fellow at The Ohio State University of Surgical Oncology. She was a categorical res um, resident at Dartmouth who did two, two years of research with us at SOAR and another year of basic science. But by the time our, our research model that Dr. Sachs is now running SOAR, but our research model is that we have a, a research resident for two years or three, but one, two or three, 
So at the beginning, they get fed a little bit. At the beginning, we may give them a hypothesis or better, they get a hypothesis or a paper that has been started by one of the senior research residents. So they, 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 most people do not have a lot of experience with outcomes research, unless it's like my last, my last 10. That's not outcomes research, that's a case series. But by the end, we want them to be forming their own hypotheses, coming to us and say, you know what? This data, I want to use this data source to look at this. So this is essentially Gilnara's, one of her senior projects. She came to me and said, I want to look at the NCDB and I want to see whether there's a regional variation in care. And, and I want to know how many people get guideline directed care. Because we all knew the Carl Bill Amore paper that was done from the NCDB very early on with this very alarming rhetoric, national failure to operate. That was very early on before the NCDB was even the NCDB. And she wanted to update that and see if there's actually difference in practice patterns because we're all from different areas of the country and do, do practice patterns vary? So she looked at the NCDB from 2006 to 2012 and divided the country into five geographic regions and looked at survival and logistic regression. And so this is entirely driven by, by Gonara. So these are the reasons she came up with in the NCDB. There's West Coast Pacific, West Central, East Central, Northeast and South Atlantic, and these are arbitrary. And she tried to define it in relatively equal numbers of, of patients. But as you know, it's, it's always imperfect. I think it's important to see what's under the hood. And the overall take home was that still in, in 2017, when we were publishing this data, based on data that ended in 2012, many in the United States still don't receive adequate care for pancreas cancer. You can see here, this is resection in stage one. This is 50% or less of patients get get Whipple operation plus or minus anything else. This is 40%, less than 40% of stage two get surgical resection and obviously vanishingly small for three and almost none for four. But we know that the uh, pancreatic resection is the only curative strategy for, pan for pancreas cancer. And yet many or most don't, don't receive adequate care. And this does still reflect a nihilism on the part of many um, that are not pancreas surgeons that, 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 that there is, you know, the, the WIP was 50% mortality, that people shouldn't be referred, that not everyone is, is fit for surgery. Now that is true, but the earlier work that we've done need, need to have a, a broader strategy for, for the treatment of pancreatic cancer and, and other diseases and not just nihilism. So this is the regions. And, and you can see here that median survival, especially at stage one um, and stage two is higher for the Northeast than for the other four design reasons. But again, you can say about disparities, but the question is not that to observe the disparities, the question is, is why might that possibly be? And so on multivariable analysis, you could say, do people find pancreas cancer at earlier stages in the Northeast? You can't swing a dead cat in the Northeast without hitting an expert pancreatic surgeon or center, but that's, 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 that is actually not true. So you actually diagnose pancreatic cancer earlier in other areas than the Northeast, as you see here. Um, and then resection, no, actually the Northeast is less likely to resect people, at least than the South, the South Atlantic and East Central. The only area in which the Northeast is different in a positive way from the other centers is that the Northeast is more likely to have multidisciplinary care. So you're more likely to have surgery plus some other adjuvant therapy rather than just sur surgery alone or just adjuvant therapy alone. So we posit based on these data that, that the survival difference that we see now in the, in the NCDB is not due to resection particularly, and it's not due to stage, but it's actually due to receiving multiple elements of care, suggesting that teams working together uh, create better care than just specialists working on their own. I wanna talk a little bit about insurance, which is, can be quite controversial. This is Jillian Smith, who's now a surgical oncologist in, in Maine, but at the time was a resident, which is started as a medical student and then a resident at UMass. And so she looked at, she combined data from both the SEER and the US Census Bureau. It was quite novel. Again, this is Jillian's entirely, her work and, and, and her hypothesis. But she found that in counties, or well, they're actually regions, US Census regions that have a high uninsurance, they have the lowest survival. Now this is moving beyond just pancreas cancer. She looked at the 10 most common solid tumors in, in, in adults, because those are all surgically treated. Surgery is the centerpiece of care for basically almost all uh, adult pink, uh, adult solid tumors, with now the possible exception of mel melanoma and things that we have inhibitors for, but still. Um, but she found that, that in, in counties with the highest insurance or the lowest percentage uninsured had the overall highest survival for all these tumors, and then those that had the most uninsurance, the least insured, had the lowest survival across the broad range of the 10 solid tumors. Now there was a range. So tumors that have D 
decent screening and treatment, say colorectal breast, had a broader change in survival. People that have that had less effective therapies, such as pancreas, uh, would would have and esophageal would have have a less of a spread, but still a significant spread in survival between the high uninsurance and low uninsurance regions. Now, some background on insurance. Massachusetts um, is a harbinger of many things, some of them good, some of them bad, but Massachusetts already started out as a relatively high insurance state. So we, we started out when I moved to Massachusetts somewhere around 11%, um, actually I wasn't attending, 11% on insurance rate, and then it has dropped precipitously. And this is Romney Care at the time. And, and so this was, it hit a low of all time low of 2.5% on insurance in Massachusetts with the um, Romney Care. And then has, has climbed up a little bit over time, but still remains the lowest in the country. So with Miriam Eskandar's hypothesis, Miriam is now attending the academic surgical oncologist at Rutgers, uh, but she was a resident at the time from Beth Israel Deacon's Medical Center. She hypothesized that, that there might be an inflection point around the uh, um, inception of new, near universal health care in Massachusetts. So it's a little bit of an experiment. Massachusetts can be a, carry, a canary in the coal mine for the Affordable Care Act, but uh, we, she was able to find that there was a difference in slope, and this is colectomy, so emergent colectomies. So the rate of emergent colectomies was slowly declining, and this is exactly 2007, which is the washout period, 2006-2007, for near universal health care in Massachusetts uh, enacted. And this, the slope significantly changed after that. And so you would think Massachusetts is already a very high insurance state. So if anything, you're gonna have a type two error, meaning that there, there might be a change, but you wouldn't pick up the change because we're only talking about that play in the population from 10% to 2% on insurance. But still we saw a change in the slope of the curve after near universal healthcare was enacted in Massachusetts. And this did not take place. We looked at the nationwide inpatient sample. This did not take place in the country as a whole. There was still a decrease in the rate of emergent colectomy, but it was a constant slope as opposed to a break in the slope. So ongoing in the last few minutes, I'll just share with you some steps as we think about health equity as a system and as an institution. These are some of the many research fellows. These are the pictures of my, some of my former uh, colleagues at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. And, and I was, had a one, wonderful seven years at UMass and six years uh, and some change at BI DMC. But I was, I told you I tried to get a job at BMC and, and BU in 2005 and failed. So if you can't, if you, if you, if you you know, but success is just basically failing and failing and failing until you finally get something and maybe it'll even be better when you get it the uh, next time around. So what's the journey? This is my son when he was younger and cuter, but um, when he is, he's wearing a little um, shirt that says hope for pancreatic cancer. And he's obviously not making a political statement here, but he's trying to decide what's the best step on, on, on the journey. Um, he's actually trying to figure out which, which thing to throw at me, um, to, to be honest with you, but, but, but that's my favorite picture. It's about, about the balance. People ask me about the balance. This is my daughter. I've been taking, I was, I was talking, to, um, talking to some of the people yesterday, but I basically had a child attached to me at every, Dr. Dua, at every, at every stage of, of the way for most of, most of my academic surgical career, and I, I really wouldn't have it any other way. But I'll tell you a little bit about BU School of Medicine, now the Jobania and Avedisian School of Medicine at BU. It was founded in 1848 as the New England Female Medical College. So it was the first US, US institution to train women four years as physicians, which I did not know when I was aiming for a job there. In 1864, the, the, uh, the, they graduated Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who was the first black female physician in the country. If you, if you watch the um, 1609 project, or love project that you'll see that, um, 1619 project, excuse me, that in the fourth, uh, episode of the podcast, they discuss Rebecca Lee Crumpler and her husband. She trained, uh, graduated from BU, and then went to um, went, went to serve in the post-Civil War South at great risk to herself, and then eventually came back and had a practice in, on Beacon Hill and, and a brownstone. Her, her grave and her husband's grave were unmarked, known area in Hyde Park, not very far from where, where we live at, at Boston Medical Center, but we and others raised funds to have a gravestone, so it's now marked, and it's a it's a wonderful landmark, and it's a, it's a, it's, I, I urge you to come visit it when you come visit us. But in 1873, the New England Female Medical College merged with BU to become then BUSM. In 1890, we graduated Charles Eastman, who was the first indigenous Western MD graduated in the country. He was from Dartmouth, and he was kind of ostracized by his report at Dartmouth. He was fully integrated at BU School of Medicine, and he was elected the speaker, the one speaker of his graduating class. 
So diversity has been at our foundation at the medical school from the very inception. Boston City Hospital, that hospital that T.K. Hunt first told me about, it, it was founded in 1864 as the first municipal hospital in the United States. Now, why do I say municipal? It was not a charity hospital. The big general hospitals were generally founded as charity hospitals. Rich people in their brownstones would be taken care of in their brownstones by their private visiting physicians or potentially in one of the clinics. So the Leahy Clinic is a prime example of ours with a Deaconess Hospital being the charity hospital that, that he would attend at as, as, as the physician in chief, um, or the surgeon in chief, excuse me, the Jocelyn was the, the physician in chief at the Deaconess Hospital. But Boston City Hospital was founded in 1864 by the government of Boston because they felt that, that healthcare should not be charity, but should be a right of the citizens of Boston. And that underpinning of Boston City Hospital underlies us today. So Boston City Hospital, when I was an intern, essentially merged with the Boston University Medical Center Hospital in 1996 to become Boston Medical Center. So in 2010, when I was still uh, in Worcester, Boston Medical Center came up with its overarching goal, an ambitious, audacious goal to make Boston the healthiest urban population in the world in 20 years. That was 2030. Well, a lot has happened between 2010 and now. This is Boston Race Day. Remember how I thought Boston was incredibly undiverse? I mean, if you would just watch Goodwill Hunting and The, the Departed and, 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 and the stereotypes of Boston and the yokels that come from the sticks to say racist things to people at basketball games and, 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 and baseball games, you would think that Boston is very different than that. Boston isn't like that. Boston is actually multicultural, diverse, and, and is racially even more mixed than Worcester was. Right now, Boston, the census says it's 45% white, 25% black, Latino is 20, and Asian is 10. That, that's not the Boston you see in the movies. So this is the Boston that we serve. And I, I will say that this is, this is largely our catchment area. This is the South End where, where BMC is. So finally, I wanna talk about a few things that my mom told me not to talk about when, when, when I was a kid, but I think are very important in our discussions about health equity. A few of them, I'm gonna omit religion here, but, but, but I'm, a few of them include race, language, and money. At BMC, more than 70% of our patients identify as minoritized patients. More than 50% are black, more than 20% are, are Latinx. More than 50% of our patients have an annual household income line below the federal, federal poverty line. I'd be interested in these data from Valley Medical Center now that I have a, a more of an understanding of this than, than I had when I was a receptionist. More than 30% of BMC patients speak a primary language other than English. And as a point of comparison, less than 50%, 15% of the hospital patients that my husband works at and the hospital I used to work at are, are in low income. So in terms of money, more than 30% of our patients speak other primary languages. And this is research that was done by Tim Feeney and, and Allison, Allison, I wanna say Drake, but Drake is the attending, Thurston Drake, Allison Wood, is the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center a resident that worked, worked with us in a, on the T32. But they basically found that nationwide, readmissions are much higher and the higher, highest quartile for patients that, that, that do not speak English as their primary language. However, at BMC, there's no difference. So length of stay, hospital revisits, mortality and complications. Now we could argue this is for a number of reasons. One is that we have this incredibly robust in-person interpretation system at BMC. We have uh, things published in our four primary languages, which are English, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese, Spanish, and the Haitian Creole. You could also argue that our white patients are more disadvantaged than the standard white patients that we see in, in large databases. So you have to consider your hypotheses. This is another paper by Alan Stolarski, who did do basic science for his research, but did a side project looking at our bariatric surgery program. Now, I, I don't know if Danny Pratt is listening uh, from home, but we talked about bariatrics, especially in the adolescent population, and we we are able to have a robust bariatric program with, with complex interpretation, education materials, psychological counseling, all in patients' primary languages. And thus we're able to find similar successful weight loss in, in a very disadvantaged population that really is, can benefit from weight loss management in bariatric surgery. Let's talk a little bit about money. So this is Elena Geary, who was a very successful SOAR re main research resident who's now back in the lab, who will be going into breast surgical oncology. Um, but she looked at white income mobility and black income mobility. And so what that is, is the odds that a child that's black or white born in a certain area has a chance to better their income over their parents. 
just, that's my simplistic way of understanding. She can explain it in a much more sophisticated way. If there's high white income mobility, if a white child has a strong chance of making more money than her or his parents, you can see here that, that, there, that this, is, this is advanced disease, this is, this is black and white, that there's no change in, this, in the slope here for either white or black people for the risk of having advanced disease at diagnosis with colorectal cancer. But if there's high black income mobility, meaning that a black child has a chance of making more money than his or her parents, that you can actually see that both white and black patients have less chance of having advanced disease at diagnosis, so that's better. And the difference starts to go away. See how these bars are almost touching each other? The, the significance of the difference starts to go away. So both white and black patients are better off with colorectal cancer living in an area with high black income mobility. You see the same types of results for all these outcomes, so resectable disease. Once there's high black income mobility, the difference goes away between blacks and whites for whether or not they're going to have resectable disease at presentation with colorectal cancer. And same thing for five-year mortality. As in, in a place where black individuals have the opportunity to make more money than their parents, the difference between blacks and whites goes away for, 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 um, in, for mortality for colorectal cancer. And then uh, let, let's talk about race. So racial disparities in Boston. In Boston, our, we have tr tremendous differences, even in Boston with, with our patients for the various outcomes across not just surgical outcomes, but maternal fetal outcomes, chronic conditions, cancer outcomes, infectious diseases, which we'll get to a little bit later, um, behavioral health and, and uh, being unhoused. I think it's very important. We're at a hospital at BMC. We talked to some about this earlier. We, we sometimes can feel a little bit more smug or more virtuous because we take care of a highly minoritized population. But I think it's even more important for those of us that are privileged to work in these settings to actually ask even more questions. We're not inherently good people because we take care of a minoritized patient population. You're not inherently anti-racist if that's the case. This is from Michael Poulsen, and these are results on, based on segregation. So I, I don't really have the time to get into redlining, but, but Michael Poulsen has looked into it extensively. And based on highly segregated areas, black patients are much more likely to have advanced stage of diagnosis if they live in a highly segregated area. This is the same for pancreatic cancer. This is Aldana Blanco, who true to her the desire to work in these areas is now working in an area with a high indigenous population in, in, in New Mexico. But you can see that the same thing as it, when you're highly segregated, you're much more likely to have advanced stage diagnosis regardless of your race. Although, although um, blacks have inferior, uh, are more likely to have advanced stage diagnosis all along than whites, but it's worse for both. So again, Michael Poulsen looking at racial segregation and redlining and this is looking at our own data. Again, I, I, I don't want to be smug at, at, at BMC or, or Valley Med, where we think that we're so great because we take care of a high a minority population. You can see here, this is BMC data. And in highly segregated areas, there's much worse screening for, for, for lung cancer. This is lung cancer data, again, from BMC. And Black patients were 15% less likely to undergo screening compared to white patients overall. 21% less likely in redlined areas. But when you take away the redlining, the former segregation, the place where people can't, or not allowed to buy houses, et cetera, that, that, that's the difference. It's the red line, the, the traditional segregation. So just to, to, to end, a lot has happened. We talked about 2010, a lot has happened in 2020 and beyond. And some of the protests and the, the recon, recognitions of, of the disparities in justice have roiled all of us in the healthcare system as well as well as in the country. COVID-19, the pandemic, really hit certain communities worse than others. And just briefly, you can see here the prior year, 2019, 35% um, of our patients that were admitted were African-American and 24% were Hispanic. COVID positive patients, our patient population, 40% were black, 35% were Hispanic. COVID positive with admission, 42% were, were black, 34% were Hispanic. And of COVID deaths at BMC, 50% were, were, were black or African-American. So there was a completely um, disparate effect of the pandemic, even in our relatively disadvantaged patient population among pa patients of color. Even gun violence. Gun violence is affected by, by traditional redlining. This is a great paper that I recommend you all read 
um, in the Lancet Regional Health. The first author is Michael Polson. The second one is Mary Manufa, both of our residents. Um, and and it's Kelly Kenzig is a PhD that works with us, but this is a, a tremendous article that it's all linked, whether, whether it's structural racism and firearm uh, violence, it's all linked back to original segregation and then its modern equivalent, which is redlining. And Miriam found in, in papers that are that are going to be coming out in press is that that the traumatic injuries were not equally distributed. That we, we we saw so much less trauma among privileged people like me that drive into work because we were driving them less, except for if we were operating, et cetera. But our patient population had nowhere to go. That that they that they experienced as much or more trauma during COVID 19 one as 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 did they previously. So COVID-19 had its harshest impact on vulnerable communities, including minorities and marginalized communities. So briefly, we are trying to address racial inequity and at BMC. We have put a $150 million bet on trying to, um, again, establish a center for health equity. We're calling it the Health Equity Accelerator at Boston Medical Center. The article in the, in the, in the Wall Street Journal about tr highlighting Tracy Deckert, but about how we are working as a hospital to try to solve some of these problems, whether it's endemic homelessness, substance abuse. We have something called Mass and Cast. Dr. Ha and I were talking about the homelessness problem in San Francisco. How do we address patients and people, our patient population, and, and still address some of the needs of the communities that are, that are around? So this, this is a broad blueprint. I'm, I'm delighted to talk to you more about it, but I don't, I don't want to keep you before um, from, from the OR, but we are, we've created a health equity accelerator on a broad base of clinical care, research and clinical trials, teaching and education and advocacy. And it's across a broad range. Um, the, the accelerator has a comprehensive blueprint. The, I have been to an enormous number of meetings about, about how we can actually, as a medical center, affect the community. There's, there's so much more than what we can just do as doctors day to day. But our experience is that our, our doctors, our providers, our nurses, and our patients are all asking us to be to do greater good than just taking care of patients one at a time that come to our medical center. But the chair is all, all trying to um, demonstrate for equity. And these are just community partners, doctors uh, coming together to do good work. And we're establishing new roles in the Department of Surgery to try to be a, a, a department that, that pushes health equity and, and, and social justice. Boston sores that become focused around the areas of eradication and disparities in surgical and cancer care. Tavia Sachs is leading it. Elena was the resident lead. Now, now we have a uh, Priyanka Chug is the resident lead, and we are building a, a, a sea and a hill. One of my favorite quotes is the, the quote from uh, the Captain Winthrop on the uh, he was a, a preacher and and on the on the ship Arabella as I was looking into the Boston. Harbor or coming into Plymouth Bay Colony, and he gives a speech, which is we're we're on a city of the, on the hill. The eyes of the world are upon us. Now this is about religion, which I wasn't going to talk about, but and it's been used by every politician in the in the world, from from John F. Kennedy to Ronald Reagan or Peggy Noonan. But I do think about this for healthcare. If, if we here, if we at Valley Med, if we at Stanford, if we at Boston Medical Center can't fix healthcare in our community, try to give more equitable healthcare, knowing that we'll, there's no perfect. And why are we here? I think we have to focus ourselves around how we can give our exquisite cardiac, vascular, uh, pancreatic, general surgical care, and yet still realize that we're in context. We, 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 we should be trying to do good. That's why we went into medicine and surgery. Our residents are inspire us. They started socially responsible surgery. And, and we believe that cost-effective and quality healthcare is more than an aspiration. It's a right, and it can be a reality. And it's not only because it's the right thing to do, it's also because it's the right financial thing to do. There's a reason why Governor Baker, who's a Republican, and BMC are working very strongly together because it actually makes sense to not make Massachusetts go bankrupt to try to give cost-effective care. So it's both the right thing to do to give care to everybody that, to, that, that make it equitable, and it's the financially sound thing to do. So my thought is that we can try in our little way to be a model for, for the country and the world in terms of delivering socially just and, and equitable healthcare. So my son is, is um, he, he used to say he didn't want to be a doctor because, because well, he wanted to be a doctor because he thought it was cool. And then he learned about residency because he, and then he said he wanted to sleep in his own bed. He didn't want to be a resident. And just recently with the stuff going on in the world, 
he he's actually started to think, well, maybe I'll be a doctor again. And, and so kids don't think you're cool when they're teenagers, but but the the these are the McCordy twins. If you follow football, Devin and Jason McCordy, um, but they they you know they spend their time actually really serving the community. I, I will say, and I they they um, this is for a, a BMC gala to raise funds for a sickle cell, and 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 I, I have to say that if if we play our cards right, we can inspire our children and our residents, and and knowing that it's hard, knowing that the work is hard. And knowing that we're never going to get there, we have relatively privileged lives in surgery and medicine. We get to when you're in there operating on someone's heart, or you're in there with your hands on someone's belly, or doing this wonderfully complex minimal invasive surgery with a robot and everything else. We get to do what's the most fun, amazing thing in the world, and we get paid for it. And and we're so lucky in what we do. And I I, I charge all of you, especially young people, remember that. And then I think what we can do is try to at least to, to make sure that everybody gets the care that they deserve. And that has been my, my, my organizing principle. And luckily my, my residents and, my, uh, and all of our children help me remember that. So when, when, when Devin asked Mateo, he said, to, oh yeah, you, um, you're gonna be a doctor like your mom? And I said, no, you're not gonna be a doctor. And he said, wait, 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 mom, mom, I, I, I might be a doctor. So whatever it takes, whether it's a football player, to, to, to inspire your kid to maybe actually uh, be interested in, in, in uh, medicine, you know, you'll, whatever it takes. So I, that's all I've got. And thank you for allowing me to be here when I'm in my home.